so you know, today, generally, we're going to talk a little bit about two topics, one of them being identity, which we're going to talk about in a few moments, and also around building a championship team culture. And Rick and Jennifer, both of you have been parts of, of great teams, great organizations. And so I just wanted to begin by asking, what goes into building a great culture at work? Go ahead, Jennifer. Let me start? Yes. OK. Um, I think it starts with leadership. I think it starts with having authentic leadership. And I think that makes a, a big difference. And, and I think you have to identify, if you are a good leader, you have to identify the values of your group. And then once you do that, I think you have to really live by those values. And obviously, you have to set a vision and goals and so on. But I think you have to have authentic leadership. And I think you have to have everyone's values aligned and going towards the same, same goal, same place. Very good. Sounds pretty simple. OK. Yeah. <laughs> really hard to do. Exactly. Right? Okay. Um, and I think you know, my experiences in the organizations I've been in, uh, uh, most of the time I've gotten to an organization when it was a little bit broken. Uh, I seem to be attracted to that kind of a situation. Uh, something wrong with me. <laughs> uh, but, but I also think it, it is a real opportunity in the life cycle of a company to make significant change. Uh, you know, rather than going to an organization that has tremendous success and trying to make it incrementally 10% better, it's a, it's a lot more interesting for me to go to an organization that is, is really not functioning and try to make a 100% change in uh, the way people show up at work every day. And we can talk a lot, a lot about that, what that means, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and I think you both can, can speak to that type of experience. Obviously, you with the Suns and then the Warriors, and you with a very stagnant USF team that you took over. Yeah. Um, can you share any examples of, of early actions you tried to, mm -hmm. to take to change the culture? Well, like Rick, I think I'm drawn to difficult situations. Um, and, and I think for me, taking over the program at USF, ignorance was bliss because I had never been in a head coaching role before and actually had never coached before. Um, so that was kind of a good thing in the beginning. Um, and I thought I could change the culture and I thought I could change the mindset um, of what was already there. And it was very difficult. I mean, there's a reason that you know teams win, and there's a reason that teams lose. And, and oftentimes, it's, it's right between your ears. It's, it's your thought process. It's, it's the way you do things. And the program at USF was not only in the bottom 10%, it was probably in the bottom 5% in the country. Um, so I thought we could make change quicker. You know, It's not like a pro organization where you can kind of change your personnel. You really have to kind of paint a picture every day of what your, what your values are, what the culture is going to look like. But it's really, really difficult to change what is there without making significant changes. And, and for us, that took you know, six years before we won a championship. Wow. What about you with the Suns and with the Warriors? Uh, very different. Suns uh, were historically a very successful franchise, but had fallen on kind of hard times competitively and financially at the time I got there. So. Uh, People there had, had experienced success and experienced a lot of success. So it was kind of just a recalibration to get back to where we were. Warriors are completely different, right? This is, for those of you who are fans, uh, you know, the way the NBA playoffs work, uh, more than half the team, 16 out of 30, actually make the playoffs. The Warriors had not made the playoffs 16 out of 17 years. And uh, I actually don't think you could write that business plan and execute it. Just by chance, you would end up in the playoffs more often than that. Uh, so there was a culture where pe everybody came to work every day expecting to lose. That's just the way it was. It was in the business office. It was in the locker room. And you know what? It, it seemed to go just fine. Like every year, everybody got a raise. Everybody got a long summer because you didn't have long playoffs. Came back the next year, you did it all over again. So that one was a complete reset about uh, getting people uh, who wanted to come along for the ride to believe what we were going to be, not what we had been. And uh, it was a really interesting process for the first year of the people who clearly could get their heads around that and want to come along for the ride, and the people who really didn't believe we were going to accomplish what I said we were going to accomplish. I see. Now, this is really interesting. You, you mentioned that it's kind of, you know, winning, losing, it's, it's in between the mm -hmm. ears. You say that it's, it's a mentality and expectation to lose. We were talking before this, this, this chat that we had Baron Davis at a talks at Google event maybe a month ago. And I'm laughing. That must have been entertaining. Right. It was. Yeah. I mean, go, go watch the video on YouTube if you haven't. But he described the same thing. He talked about how he shows up. He wasn't initially excited. He said he didn't even want to come to the Warriors. And he shows up, and he felt that organizationally people felt like losing. And his approach, he talked about on stage, was 
Let me get to know every level of the organization. Let me get to know the trainers, the ball boys, the doctors, obviously the team, the front office. Let me try to figure out what they're about and try to you know, influence them individually. Does that approach resonate with you both, or have you found other tips or tricks that have helped? Absolutely. I mean, I think any, any championship team I've been on, whether it's as a coach or a player, or, you know, somewhere in between, um, everyone felt a part of it from, you know, the person that sweeps the floor to, you know, the, the leader of the entire organization. And everyone's energy has to be going the same direction. And I, I can really relate to what Rick said, too, about the culture of the Warriors, because it was the same at USF. I mean, I think people had gotten really complacent. And, and I think oftentimes, human nature is people want to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. So a big thing that we used to talk about with our team is get comfortable with being uncomfortable, because it's going to be hard. And if you want to succeed and you want to win, it's hard. I mean, we had class conflicts, so I got tired of it. We practiced at 6 in the morning. And once they, you know, once the team got used to it and then they felt like great high achievers, you know, you just you get through that practice and you you've achieved something greater than you have in, you know, years. So, it's just it but it's a lot of work. Yeah, I understand that. I mean, I I think what one thing that you have to commit to the people who work with you is that you're going to you're going to judge each person by their own abilities and their own talents, right? So, we had Again, a lot of people who had not been successful or been buried in the organization, and the, the promise was, look, we're, you're going you're gonna to excel in this organization based on what you do and, and the talent that you bring to work every day. And we now, you know, through that process, ended up with two or three today of the senior leaders in the organization who have been there for 17 years because they were kind of buried in the organization and hadn't really been given a voice or been given the opportunity to show. And to me, that was important to have some of those success stories to go along with, you know, all those people who weren't going to stick around, who we then could go out and recruit the best and brightest in those particular disciplines. And the combination of that, I think, gave the senior team especially uh, some organizational credibility because people all knew they're there because for a good reason. And I think that that's been a big part of how we've been able to to navigate this. Interesting. So. Uh you know, one of the things that I was going to ask about is, as a casual fan, a casual observer, when, when we talk about team culture, it, it often is, is really talking about the on-court product. Um, what's going to happen to the Warriors culture if we add DeMarcus Cousins, right? Things, things like that are what we talk about. And both of you are talking so much about the whole organization. And I know Rick has talked about you started your basketball career 16 years old as a ball boy for the Seattle Sonics. And so you saw how the doctors interact with the players, the staff, like it's a full, the organization's like, like a living, breathing entity. And I remember you've said it hasn't changed much since then yeah. to now. Can you tell us about, about that? Like, Well, I, you know, I, I had an amazing advantage that people who sit in my seat don't get to have. So I'm a fly on the wall as a 16-year-old kid in an NBA locker room getting to see exactly what you said, the interaction between players, between players and coaches. Nobody's paying any attention to me. I can just soak all this <laughs> in, right? The media, training staff, ownership, uh, reporters. It's, you know, it was, it was a wonderful crash course that I still, I think, call on today. Um, and, and it hasn't changed that much. It really, you know, the dynamics in sports of what those roles are and how they intersect. Uh, you know, the one that has changed probably more than any is the media, right? Because okay. when I would, uh, when we were entertaining the media after a game, then there were two or three reporters who were print reporters who uh, were covering the team. And now, today at a Warriors practice, we probably have 30 or 40 uh, reporters representing all kinds of media outlets that, that, you know, players, frankly, used to be able to get away with a lot more. And purporter, reporters, used to protect players in ways because they were they had a different kind of relationship than they do now. Our I can tell you the professional athletes today are under more scrutiny than any profession period in terms of their personal behavior and how they conduct themselves. It's really hard because you are always on. I mean, TMZ is this far right away, yeah. right? And uh, it's actually, I think, quite remarkable to see the way uh, that locker room has evolved as it relates to the media. Very cool. And you know, Jennifer, for you, uh, a lot of us in the audience, people who work in tech, it's pretty in vogue right now to jump jobs a lot, whether it's internally, move around within the Silicon Valley, externally to other companies. And I was thinking about your career, I mean, professionally with a few different teams, playing for the Olympics, coaching in the collegiate ranks, winning a championship as a college athlete. I guess I would wonder, um, how, how did your perception of what makes a good team culture or a good team leader evolve from being a player to then being a coach? 
Wow, that's a tough one. Um, I think just being around people that were successful and watching what they did and how they did it mm. is, and, and then I also, you know, before I started coaching, I kept a little notebook of the things I liked and didn't like about certain coaches mm. so that when I coached, I wouldn't do the things that I thought were maybe not appropriate or, you know, not motivating or, you know, that kind of thing. So I just think I've always looked around me, um, whether it's in the sports world or not, but at people that are good at their jobs and good leaders and really tried to, to learn from that. But I think team culture is pretty consistent across the board. I mean, if you have people that care and that are very engaged and all are kind of moving in the same direction, and, and, and I think who are, and I know we're going to get to talk about this, but who are really authentically themselves, when you can bring your whole self to what you do and you don't feel split, um, I think that also makes a very successful situation. Very cool. That's a good transition, actually. Thank you. I appreciate that. So we've talked a bit about culture, and, and identity is another thing that's important. And we were chatting before about how a core tenet of Google's culture is that we should all feel comfortable bringing our whole selves to work. And so, you know, what does identity mean to you, and has that changed for you over your life and career? Well, it certainly changed for both of us, right? Mm -hmm. So I, uh, it wasn't until 2011 in this little front page story in the New York Times, I came out as a, as a gay man in sports, right? And at the time, uh, the highest ranking, you know, person in kind of my career that, or my field that had taken that step. And up until that point, I was a really happy person. I had a really successful career. Uh, but there was, especially in men's professional sports, there was this fear in me that, that somehow bringing my authentic self to work could potentially be damaging to the career that I wanted to have. And it took me a long time to get to the point where I was, I felt I was at a place where it was important to me to, to do, take that step. And, uh, you know, I, I think, I don't regret how long it took me. It was my story, it's my process, it happened at the right time. Um, you know, it's wonderful now to have a different relationship with some of my coworkers. Uh, I can, you know, I, I had purposely set up walls uh, around you know, what people felt comfortable approaching me about. No one ever asked me if I was gay in my entire career. But, you know, when I came in after the weekend, I would purposely not ask Jen what she did that weekend because I didn't want her to ask me who I was hanging out with or what I was doing. So people figure it out and are respectful about that. But it, but it, it's a sacrifice, right? It's a sacrifice to somebody who's in that position. It, you know, I think, you know, I wish I'd had better relationships with a lot of those people at a different level than I had. I do have those now, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I'm probably better at what I do at work because of that now today. And I think I'm probably a better leader because of that today. So, you know, but it, but that's a journey. But yes, did it change? It changed pretty significantly. Yeah. For you too. Well, yeah. And I, I thought everyone knew. Like I didn't. I didn't feel like I had to make some big announcement. Like I'm gay. I have a part at that time. A partner now. A wife. Um, and it didn't change until I was actually introducing Rick at the ADL Awards. And you know, I, I remember going for a run in the morning with my wife Blair, and and I said, okay, I'm going to introduce Rick this evening, but. I don't know how I can do him justice. First of all, I don't know why I'm doing it, but I don't know how I can do him justice. I can't just read his bio. Like, I've <laughs> got to do something. And she's like, oh, you'll be great. Whatever you want to say is fine. So then I get on stage, and I just said, thank you. Because his example for me has helped me in so many ways, but absolutely helped me in a leadership role. And, and I thought being open um, with my team or my players at USF would actually hurt me as well. I thought, you know, if you're the, the gay coach, well then you're not gonna get any recruits and you know, it's gonna change everything. And it actually did just the opposite. You know, I ended up um, becoming a lot closer with my players and you know, I think they respected me that much more. I mean, they, they definitely respected me for my knowledge, and, you know, but I didn't realize that they didn't feel like they knew me. I thought they knew me because I'm the same person every day. I walk in, I'm positive, I'm me, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing my job. But when you can go on a deeper level with people, I think you can have so much more of an impact. And what I realized is there were so many people around me that I either knew or didn't know that had the same struggle going on. And so after you know, introducing Rick and having this whole you know, coming out thing, um, it, made a, it made a big difference. And, and my wife and I got emails and calls and things from people that were gay, straight, anything emailing us saying, just thank you. Thank you for you know, being authentic and, and have, being a good example for us. Wow. 
So, you know, you both have talked about having a full career, a really successful, happy career prior to making that choice. Mm -hmm. And so I do want to ask, um, you know, I, I know Rick's story a little bit and that you had lost a parent and a lot was going on in your life when you were in Phoenix. What went into, for both of you, making that, that choice, I guess? You, yeah. Well, mine was easy. It was Rick's fault. Yeah. So, he, <laughs> so if, if you hadn't asked me to do that, She's, I don't know if I... She I stole the show. Yeah, that exactly. She stole the show. No, um... No, I think it was just the right moment. I mean, I, like Rick, I too don't regret anything. I don't, you know, it was, it was the right time for me. It was the right moment for me that just, you know, kind of hit me. And, and I think, you know, hopefully helps people and, and has some type of a, a positive impact. But um, I don't know about you. Well, I, you know, I had been thinking about this for a while. And uh, I, I would have a bad breakup. Um, and I, uh, part of it was because I couldn't include the person that was most important in my life into my professional life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that made a big impact on me. I did have, uh, my dad had passed away. My mother had been diagnosed with lung cancer. So I, I had really decided, like, it was now or never. And I didn't have any idea how to put it in perspective. So I actually invited a friend of mine, his name's Dan Cloris, I don't know if you're watching right now, the uh, Basketball Love Story, the mm -hmm. series on ESPN, he actually produced Basketball Love Story, but his prior life was kind of a media guru of New York, and I invited him to go to dinner one night and just said, Dan, like, I, I don't even know how to put this in perspective, I need your view of this, like, I'm thinking of, like, doing this. and. I can either like just talk to the people I work with and the people I've worked with in my life, and that'll be great, and we can take care of it that way. But if you, but it, but maybe there's something gnawing at me that says maybe there's something better that could be accomplished by doing that. And he, <laughs> it's gonna be a great scene in the movie. <laughs> he looked across the dinner table at me and he just said, "Ricky." He's got this funny voice. Calls me Ricky. Ricky, like if you're if you're willing to do this. Uh, I want to help you, and I think it's page A1, New York Times. And that was kind of my oh shit moment, right? Yeah. Like, like, whoa, mm -hmm. serious. And, uh, you know, so we went on a journey. He connected me with a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter from the New York Times, and the Times wanted to do the story and make it a front page story. And, and, uh, because I'd done my job decently, nobody knew who I was, right? Yeah. So, uh, but the people I'd met in my life, everybody knew. So we actually decided to try to tell the story by letting other people tell it. So I went on my little tour of asking friends that we'd never had this discussion about if they would talk to a reporter for the New York Times. So wow. Bill Russell, Steve Nash, uh, people like that, who uh, David Stern, you know, who people who then told my story, and and I, it was an amazing blessing to to have it come together that way, and and have it kind of it was prophetic, whatever Dan said at that dinner table that night, because it's exactly the way it played out. That's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. You know, um, we can we can talk about the fact that the the LGBTQ plus movement has made incredible strides over the past years. The fact that we're having this conversation today may not have happened ten years mm -hmm. ago which is wonderful. Um, but I remember, so I'm a big Kevin Garnett fan, so I was a fan of the Celtics when um, Jason Collins became the first um, openly out uh, player in any of the major, the four major North American professional sports. And I remember thinking this is gonna be a big moment, that this is gonna change sports, this is a huge step. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in sports, it hasn't taken off the way that some of us had expected. Um, wondering if you have any thoughts about why that is or what sports can do better to support people in that situation? I think continuing to have people that speak out and are truthful and you know, are willing to be open and live their lives because everyone needs role models that somehow look a little like them or there's some, there's some commonality there. And so I think you know, even seeing Jason was a wonderful thing for me. And um, you know, I, I just think we need more people to be open and honest. I think that's the that's probably the biggest thing. Um, sure. Because there is a lot of support, but there's so much, still so much pressure and fear. And if you, you've grown up with that and you've grown up with, you know, I, I remember as a kid feeling very conflicted. I'm, I'm very, um, I have a strong spiritual belief and, and religion. And so I felt very conflicted. You know, so do I, do I choose this core part of myself or do I feel this pressure that I can't, you know, one, one thing my mom actually said to me when I was a kid is, when I came out to her, she said, um, I was like, well, is God still going to love me? And she said, well, is there anything that you could do to make me love you any less? 
And I was like, hmm, no, I guess not. And she said, well, that's God's love for you. So you go out and you be an example for other people. And I'm lucky that I have that foundation, but a lot of people don't. And I think that's why you know, seeing Rick's strength and other people um, motivates me, and I hope that we can do the same for others. I'm disappointed that the progress hasn't happen faster. Um, you know, I, I separate a little bit from kind of uh, the team side from the rest of the organization because I think we have made really good strides in our business organizations, in, in our league, we, our league leadership. You know, at, we talked about it. We were talking about Adam Silver earlier. I've ridden in the Pride Parade with Adam Silver in New York City. Like, yeah. you know, that's a pretty cool commissioner. Yeah. Uh, and you know, in our business organizations, I, mean, I think all of our teams now have diversity and inclusion councils. I think they're very powerful voices there. Um, and I think we have tried to send out every signal that this is going to be an inclusive environment. Um, yet on the playing side, that's been harder. Um, so I, uh, we had decided to put the All-Star Game in Charlotte, North Carolina, oh, yeah. a couple years ago, three years ago, I think. And uh, then uh, the legislature had passed some very uh, offensive legislation to the LGBTQ community. And, and our league had to decide whether or not we're still going. And uh, you know, Adam, uh, in an owner's meeting in Las Vegas, uh, like gave me kind of the last opportunity to speak to the subject before the owners voted on it. And I just you know, was able to say honestly to the owners sitting around the room, like, you know, I'm in touch with people in a lot of your organizations who reach out and talk to me because for whatever reason they, they feel like they can connect with somebody who's in their situation and they don't feel yet like they're in a situation that they're ready to take that step. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just want you to think about those people in your organizations when you're deciding what to do here. And, you know, they, they voted not to take the game there. Now, things happen subsequently to improve the situation. We are going back there this year. But, but, but I do think for players, you know, you really have to remember. I have, a, I have to remind myself how young mm -hmm. these players are and what a short time they have to earn a living at the one thing they're always going to be the best at doing. And it's a huge amount of pressure. It's, it's you know, it, it, we're talking about 20-somethings, right? I wasn't ready at that point in time. And yet we expect, you know, professional athletes to have like this maturity beyond their years. And so I think they still, I still think a lot of players would look at it as a big risk. I will tell you one, the most interesting comment I got through this whole process was with uh, a radio talk show host in San Francisco who we were talking about this and he was a former player. He said, you know, I don't, I don't think there'd be an issue about players accepting a gay player. Yeah. He says, I think a player would be very concerned about um, the attention that would go along with it and the potential to disrupt that very fragile Kind of team environment, and you know, kind of overwhelming to the to the team, not just to the person. And I think there's something to that. I think yeah. it's a very fragile, you know, chemistry that a team has to have to be successful, and and things can disrupt that. And I think players, I think a lot of very thoughtful players have decided that you know, I'm not sure I want to risk that on behalf of my team, not not because mm -hmm. of how it would affect me, but on behalf of my team. Very interesting insight. Thank you both for sharing those. I think, not to play a blame game, but I think, you know, Jennifer, your answer about what, what can we do to improve uh, the way things are, you focused on leaders. So if we have role models and leaders who create that culture, things will move forward. And you've mentioned that, well, leaders are trying to create that culture. Players even seem to be open to it. So is it, is it the media then that we can blame a little bit? Is there a way to mitigate the response or... You know, I, it's such a personal journey, right? It's such a personal decision. I can never counsel anybody yeah. to, to, you know, that you need, you have to, you owe it, or you need to do that. It, I think it's a really, uh, I, 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 it's going to happen. Um, I, you know, I think it's likely to happen with a young player maybe in college who comes into the pros who has a different view of the world than, than uh Somebody who's older, I, I, but I, but I really do understand it. I'm disappointed in it, but I understand. I will also add one thing. Like my partner and I got invited to uh, the White House the last year of Obama's uh, presidency for his Pride celebration, mm -hmm. and you know, 
his words come back to me all the time because he was very proud of what had been accomplished during his administration and we're sitting in some you know room at the at the white house and he's talking and his he he was giving the most cautionary speech that i thought was even odd at the time it's like this isn't over right this this could all get reversed as quickly as it's happened wow. and uh that weekend, the Pulse nightclub shooting happened. And, you know, I think culturally in this country, we've taken a couple steps back. So, and I, and I think some things maybe are at risk today that maybe five years ago we would have assumed were forever, yeah. right? And I think, I, so I think there's also, the environment's changed a little bit. I think in our culture, I think it's, it's uh, you know, hate is a real thing today, that more so than it was five years ago and part of, We've empowered people to express it in ways that uh, maybe were unthinkable, at least to me, five years ago. And I think I think there's a little of that environment that's probably playing into it as well. That's also a fantastic insight. Thanks for sharing that story with us. Um, you know, I think to shift gears just a little bit, um, talking about identity, there's there's all sorts of different things that go into identity. There's all different kinds of diversity. And talking with you, Jennifer, all the work you're doing with the AZ Academy and your role with NBA now, you're really reaching out to bring basketball and bring a future in basketball to the masses, all types of different folks. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing? Sure. And just to give you a little background, um, the NBA brand globally, and I think Rick can probably speak to this more as well, but um, if you look at what they're doing for youth around the world, there's, if it, you look at it like a pyramid, there's junior MBA, which is worldwide now, then there are basketball schools, then there are academies, and then there's global academies at the top of the pyramid, and that's where we're working currently as my wife and I actually get to work together on this, which is really fun, um, but we get to develop the programming for the women around the world, which is really exciting. So to go somewhere like you know India, I wasn't sure you know what, what they would be able to do, what the talent's like, and Every region that we've been in, so whether it's you know Latin America, India, China, um, Senegal, the thing that I've taken away from it is number one, basketball is a universal language. So even if the kids don't speak English and have a hard time with it, you can put anyone on the court from any walk of life, any background, any race, and you can play this beautiful game. And so that's exciting. But the players that we've been working with are so grateful. So it's so wonderful to go around and have you know kids say thank you for in India you know thank you for coaching us. I was like what are you sure? You know it's just but they're they're just so so respectful and and I love that you know the NBA is so respectful of women and is also investing not just in the the men's academies around the world but also in developing uh, women around the world and on the men's side it's pretty clear the goal is if you can have a residential program which is a little bit like being in college here but without quite the academic pressures and you can practice all the time so you don't have you know, kind of the NCAA rules, but if they can use the NBA technology to develop, um, you know, a, a player out of India or China, you know, you think about the impact Yao Ming had here and also had on the, the market in China, you know, that's just, that's huge for the worldwide, you know, the global brand of the NBA. Um, but again, I'm, I'm happy that they're also investing in the women's side. Here's, here's an interesting one that we've gotten from uh, our global audience. Uh, though we all feel lucky to work for Google, I don't know a Googler that hasn't experienced some form of failure in the course of their career. Can you share a moment in which you failed on your path to where you are now and how that shaped you? <laughs> you don't I probably have, have any. You no, don't I have, have more any. than Rick. No, so you don't have any. I'll, I have a couple few good ones, <laughs> but I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, I'm just going to go back to my experience at University of San Francisco when I took over. Um, I really thought that we could win faster just because I thought, you know, we can work harder and we won four games my first year and five my second year. And that was really, really, really hard. And then also being a coach, not a player, you know, you're sort of one removed from, you can't go out and do it, right? So um, that was really challenging. And at the time, I don't know that I necessarily looked at it as failure. I think everyone around me did though, because I had done nothing but win. So I remember, you know, my college coach, don't take this job. My dad called me on a regular basis, are you okay? You know, it's like everyone just sort of looked at here I am just, you know, treading water failing. And there was something inside of me that knew that, you know, we were, we were going to eventually, we couldn't look at our wins and losses, we had to look at our incremental steps towards getting better. 
Um, but that was very, very difficult. And I'm, I'm sure that as much as you know, people say it's got to be heaven working at Google, I mean, you coming on the campus, I mean, you can go out and play whenever you want. It's pretty cool. You can eat. You can do everything. I'd probably bring your dogs, kids, right? Oh, yeah. Um, but I'm sure there are also the challenges that come with you know, any job. And I think you just have to stay true to whatever your vision is and, and why you're there in the first place. Cool. Thank you. Let's take an audience question. The, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, you know, your organization was changing and other voices were coming out. Um, when you have so many superstars, but you also have <laughs> hidden superstars, how are you able to, because all those ideas, each one could actually be a success, but when you have all the ideas together, and the my main question is, how do you bring the hidden ideas from those people who are less willing to speak up, less willing to share, maybe they're not bringing their whole self yet, but they have an amazing idea, and that's why they were hired here. Interesting. How, how are you bringing that out? Yeah. Well, uh, I love our coach, Steve Kerr. And actually, he coined a phrase a few years ago that actually, we've, we've adopted organizationally as kind of our mantra, not only our basketball team, and that's strength in numbers. And the, that what's behind strength in numbers is that, yeah, we got Steph Curry and Kevin Durant, but without the other 12 guys on the roster, uh, we're not going to win a championship. And, you know, they've created an atmosphere in the locker room that celebrates uh, the individual craziness of each one of those guys. Like, it's the funniest locker room in the history of the world. Like, everybody gets made fun of, whether you're the best player or the worst player. And there's something about who you are that everybody decides is the most fun thing to, to make fun of the whole time. And it's different in our business uh, environment. I mean, we, we do actually a lot of training and coaching on this because, you know, on, on you know, meeting dynamics and things like that, because there's some wonderful science around it now where people who really care about getting the best out of people really can understand that there isn't a one-size-fits-all outgoing, you know, hard-charging personality that can dominate a room in the meeting and you get the best result. It doesn't always work that way. And we're, we're, I, I think it's a work in progress for us to make sure that the voices, uh, that, that we're extracting the best out of each of the people we have by making them feel like, they not only have the opportunity, but the obligation to contribute their thoughts if they're in an environment where an issue is being discussed. I mean, the way I say it, like, you're not, you're, you're in this meeting because you're a smart person who has a point of view, and I kind of expect you to express that. It's harder for some people than it is for others, and a lot of guys forget to listen to a lot of other people sometimes when they're where when there's talking in a meeting and we try to call people out on that we try to we try to actually get better at that and i and i do think it's a process i don't think we're there yet but i think the fact that we're aware of it and want to make sure that that we're providing that platform for people to be the best they can be is is something that we stand for i just have a quick little story. So when I was also coaching at um, USF, we lost to Santa Clara, and it was when we were getting better, and we literally should have, we should have just crushed them. And so we had, you know, I could feel that we had some issues and things going on with the team. So I said, all right, guys, we're going to all get in a room, and we're going to talk. And I want you guys to say anything to me that you might need to say, get off your chest, whatever. We've got to figure out whatever's going on. So we get in the room, and one of the players who doesn't speak a lot said, well, coach, I just don't, I just don't know if we should have you know, a stopwatch and times on our sprints, you know, because some players are having a hard time, you know, and they're really struggling with making the times. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I have to listen to the ideas that I think are crazy too, right? <laughs> I'm asking for this. Um, but to provide an environment where I actually could get stuff back that I didn't want to hear and that I thought might be ridiculous. But what it did is it helped me to get to the psychology of why those kids were upset. And I, told, I explained to the group, I'm like, a basketball game is 40 minutes. It doesn't change, unless, obviously, you go to overtime or whatever. So we have to have a time and a, and a score, and we have to have measurements on what we do. Now, the ones that are really struggling with this, maybe let's figure out how you can either you know, eat better, um, you know, work on some other areas, so you, and, and work on the mental side so you don't feel so much pressure in making your times. Because I'm not getting mad at them for not making them. It's just this is the standard. But it was just really interesting to get in a room with them and listen to some things that I think they were just scared to say. And, and again, I think as a leader, you have to um, be OK with the things that you don't agree with and, and maybe figure out why they're thinking and feeling that way so they feel validated. 
Um, so winning solves a lot of problems, especially in sports. Uh, but right now, the Warriors are going through a bit of a tough time, at least for Warrior standards. One three in a row. I know. <laughs> you lost to my Bucks by 35, though. Uh-oh. Rush. Um, so how do you? How are you managing the conflict that's going on uh, right now with the organization, both in terms of win and losses, but also with what's going on in the media, with the story about Draymond and KD, for example? Did I mention I love our coach? Yeah, I love our coach. He's the best. He is, has a way of dif- diffusing any situation and making it OK, right? And he's a master at it. I, I try to learn from him. Because you know, the idea that two players have an argument on the basketball court is not like the first time that's ever happened, right? They have, the, it happened, we happen to be, uh, have a microscope on us, unlike any other team in the NBA, maybe in sports right now. So, you know, and we have 29 other teams and media rooting for a storyline that shows that the cracks in the armor are finally appearing and this whole thing's ready to fall apart. So it's, you know, it, it's bring the group together and have an honest discussion about what's going on, what people are going to ask, what, you know, what our responses as teammates ought to be. And I think that uh, that ship got righted pretty quickly. Um, couldn't agree with you more. We, we have, uh, we've in, we're, we have an industry. The biggest fault in our industry is that we've designed uh, an industry where half the teams have to lose every night. Mm. I don't know if you focused on that. <laughs> when you work at Google, you win most of the time, right? <laughs> if you work in sports, like half the teams, you're pretty much certain are going to lose every night. So you can't just build it on winning, right? Because law of averages is, is it's not going to continue to be that way forever. We've had an amazing streak. It's a historic streak. We're trying to go to the finals for the fifth consecutive year. And I don't know how many basketball historians are there. It's been done before. Um, I don't know if you can name who has done it. Maybe Magic Johnson's Lakers? No. Maybe Russell Larry Bird's Celtics. Celtics? No. Maybe Michael Jordan's Bulls? No. Hasn't been done since Bill Russell's Celtics. Uh, in the 60s. So it's historic what we're trying to do now, and the pressure mounts as, as time goes on. It sounds like it should make it easier. In some ways, it makes it harder. And I think that um, the locker room, you have to have a leader in the locker room, uh, not only as your coach, but as a player who's willing to add perspective. We have, a, we have some great ones. Andre Godala is a guy, Mr. Perspective, right? Steph Curry doesn't talk a lot. But when he speaks, everybody listens. Draymond Green has his role. You know, okay. uh, but but he's the only one who plays that role, right? We need that on our team. So I I think it's uh, it's just the willingness to engage as teammates and the willingness to decide as teammates how you want to respond to these things and having a leader in in your coach that's willing to to make that forum happen and and force that conversation to take place. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Well, thanks a lot just for your time. It's been really great just to hear your different stories and your experiences. I was really relating a lot because I've also uh, played sports as well, and sports has been a big part of my life too. And I've been a part of big teams uh, on the court as well as off the court in professions. And I remember different times where I've been in a situation where you're trying to change the culture, and I was relating a lot to what you were saying with you have the vision of what you're trying to achieve, and you're trying to bring everybody along there. And some people might get it, some people may not. But one thing I um, have experienced too or have seen is that when leaders are in that situation, you're in those the times right before it starts to turn, that you can feel alone and like your vision and like what you're trying to do. And you might even wonder to yourself, is this really right? Or Mm -hmm. maybe self-doubt or things like that. So just curious, like, have you experienced that or just different thoughts along those lines? Yeah, I mean, you described that really well. I mean, and, and I think too, it's like the classic thing in life too, right? Right when something's about to turn, you want, you're, you're almost ready to quit, but you know there's something telling you to stick with it, stick with it, stick with it. Um, but there are many times I'd, before I'd walk into the gym, kind of feeling like, am I the only one that really believes this? Am I the only one that, that sees this? We had a moment with our team before we won the championship. We were huddled up at, at uh, center court, which we would do that after every practice. And I had just found out, regardless of how we performed in the WCC tournament, that we would go to the NIT, which for USF at that time, going to the NIT is still a really big, that's a successful season. You're at 20 wins, you know, it's a big deal. We were rated sixth going into the conference tournament. 
Um, but sixth in our conference was like literally a matter of one or two points. You could have been in second. Like it just was that tight. <coughs> and we had to upset, you know, three, two, and one to end up, you know, winning the whole thing. So I didn't want him to feel any pressure. I was like, you guys have had a great season. We're on our way. Don't go have fun. We're holding hands. One of the players, um, and I, I don't want, I'm not going to say what she said exactly, but she said, coach, it was like she was mad at me. She said, coach, mm, the NIT, we're going to the NCAA tournament. And that was the, I, mean, I still have chills when I think about it, because it shifted from my feeling it to them. It shifted from me to them. So that was, when we went to that tournament, I just knew. I was like, they got it. Like, it's, this is not me walking to the gym by myself saying the same thing over and over again. And so I did. It felt like a shift from, you know, kind of me to, like, us all, you know, really coming together. We needed that in order to do what we did that season. So great point, because I don't, I don't know that, you know, people necessarily articulate that that well. I think everybody has exact those feelings. If you're, if you're going to try to do things that are hard and do things that maybe haven't been done before, you're going to feel like you're out there on an island once in a while. I, I was, you know, everybody does. And, and I was having this conversation. Did I tell you I love our coach? Yeah. <laughs> I was having this conversation with him not that long ago, and we're kind of going back to the beginning. He had never coached a game before he coached the Golden State Warriors. And you know, he'd won five championships, but he'd never been a coach. And uh, he was talking about exactly that, like all the preparation that went into his first training camp and, and like sitting there at his first game going like, I have no idea if any of this is gonna work, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And he's, he had that moment. Yeah. He had that moment where it's like, I don't know. Like, I, I, I've done everything I think I can do, but I don't know if this is gonna work. So. You shouldn't feel, I mean, it's almost comforting to know that everybody has yeah. those moments. And you have to push your way through and, and get to the other side. Hi, yeah, thanks for being here. This has been really great. And thank you for sharing your stories. I uh, wanted to touch on something that we talked about earlier around um, bringing your whole self and this concept of vulnerability. And like with athletes who, in order to become an elite athlete, the amount of self-belief that you have to have in yourself to get there, but also creating a culture where it's safe to uh, be accepting of like what you may not possess or your faults or your vulnerabilities. So how you, in an environment just like that, how you navigate those types of situations. You're the athlete. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess if I look at it from being the athlete in the locker room, not the coach, um, I, I think you're right. I mean, it's like athletes have that, if you're at a certain level, you've got that confidence and that belief and that strength and that, you know, so how do you, how do you show that other side? I, I do think, to Rick's point earlier, it's really difficult. Even in a women's locker room, it's very difficult because you're supposed to be, you know, strong and, and, and keep people together. And, um, but I think if you have good leadership, be it in coaching or captains or, you know, people, I also love Steve Kerr. He's amazing. I think, you know, he does such a fantastic job with this. Um, but I think just encouraging people to be themselves. Because I think if anyone has been in any sort of suc successful situation, you know that the group does better when people are authentically themselves. Even that strong dude in the, in the locker room. I mean, that's, it's important that people can be vulnerable and, and share, you know, all sides. And there still has to be a professionalism, though, because I, you know, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to go out and hang out and it's all friendly, friendly. Um, but there has to be some level of, of being who you are. I, I think it's a great question. I, I think one of the biggest challenges in business is getting people to ask questions about things they don't understand, right? Like, I, in a, especially like in a meeting environment or something, I try to be that guy in the meeting who, who like, I know nobody understood what that person just said, but everyone's afraid to look like the dumb one who didn't get it. So I like to be that one. I like to be that dumb one. Like, I have no idea what you just said. Like, I have no idea what that means. Can you explain to me, you know, what that means? And it can, it can you know, kind of take the pressure out of a group. And you can, as a leader, like, I think you can influence how more, how much more confident people are in being inquisitive about things that they feel vulnerable about because, because you're prepared to make yourself vulnerable, too. Thank you for coming here today and sharing your, your thoughts and feelings. Um, so my question is a bit about ego. Um, in sports, you've definitely seen ego play out in terms of players not being willing to sacrifice their roles. Um, you know, when you 
and it's common today in the NBA to have these, you know, three three star teams, you know, the the Miami Heat, the Warriors. Um, and I like to think about, you know, the times where, you know, you saw Jordan make that extra pass to one of the shooters or LeBron learn how to trust Mario Chalmers or, or Bosch. Or even on the flip side, how Bosch had to accept, you know, okay, I'm not going to be the first option anymore. Can you talk to me about how you talk to your players about relinquishing that ego, that ability, or the, the thought process of, like, I'm the man or, or the woman, and I'm going to score 25 a night, as opposed to I'm going to sacrifice so that we can win? Well, I think you just have to ask people if they want to win or not. Like, if you want to win, this is, this is what we need to do to get there. I think the Warriors this season, great example when uh, Clay Thompson ended up breaking Steph Curry's three-point record, and Steph's the one making sure he has the ball. You know, it's like I think Steph is the ultimate team player, and as good as he is, um, I, I think that's contagious. And, and I think when you have that on a team, that you can be really successful. And I think if winning is the priority over you know, self, obviously, um, then I think, I think you can get there. But I think leadership matters. I mean, I think having a coach like Steve, really, he, he's able to manage all those different personalities and make them all feel included and important regards to the points on the board. You know, I think for our team, the, uh, the, the thing that our general manager, Bob Myers, always points to uh, was when we asked Andre Iguodala, you know, NBA All-Star, Olympic champion, to not start and to come off the bench, which for an NBA player is a big difference. And he willingly like, accepted that role. And as an example to his team, it was extraordinary and really helped set the tone for the team that we have today because he was willing to, to, to accept something that a lot of players wouldn't have been willing to accept. Very cool. And I think, uh, unless there's any more audience questions, I'll ask one more. I think. When, when you look at the Warriors as they're currently built and as they've been built through this run, there are so many players who fit a certain mold really well. Um, even the guys like Livingston at one time, uh, Mo Spates, like everybody kind of plays that role well. And you always talk about Steve Kerr and kind of the way that he uh, commands people's respect. I don't think I knew how good he was at that until he took over as coach of the Warriors. Observing him, is there a, a trait or set of traits that he, you know, he utilizes to get that respect? He's an awesome communicator. There's no player on his roster who's confused about what their role is or what they should be doing or what his expectations are for them. And as easy as that sounds, I think a lot of coaches yeah. aren't really good at that. And players you know, are not sure uh, exactly, exactly where they fit in. I will say that. One of the benefits of having some sustained success is, uh, you know, all those players aren't the same. You know, uh, whether you mentioned Demarcus Cousins or Matt Barnes or Nick Young or players <laughs> that, you know, in other environments may not have uh, succeeded really well uh, because of the structure of that team now and the leadership in the locker room. You can bring a player like that in who, who can have a, a new approach to the way they're playing the game. I remember, I sound really old now, Dennis Johnson, is that an, a player you, you know, all, like a Hall of Fame player? We drafted him at the Sonics when I was uh, there. Um, incredibly athletic, could jump out of the gym, couldn't hit the side of the barn shooting when he was drafted. Um, and won a championship with us as a starting uh, two guard uh, with the Sonics, was a total jerk the whole time he was there. Was not a good teammate, was not a good person to be around. Uh, got traded to Phoenix, um, had the same problem in Phoenix after a couple years. Got traded to Boston and became a completely different player because he got put in an environment with Larry Bird, Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale, and that wasn't the way it worked there. And he wasn't, he wasn't the big dog there. And became the, better, the best player imaginable, all-star repeatedly, champion repeatedly. But, but there, if you can create the right culture, you can, people, you can bring people into that culture who may not naturally gravitate toward that, but will because of the strength of the people around them. Very cool. Jennifer and Rick, thanks for being here. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.